room tube project started almost a decade ago, a scientist, Yolanda Sibea, started thinking about early osteoarthritis of the knee, how difficult it would be to diagnose it, and started her first project, really, was to standardize the knee exam. My focus is really on um, identifying osteoarthritis at an early stage. Um, and I, I came to this problem when I was recruiting for a study using standard criteria, and they included x-ray. Um, and I found when I was recruiting patients for that study that the majority of the patients didn't qualify for the study because they had normal x-rays, but clinically they had typical symptoms of osteoarthritis. So I realized that we're missing a huge segment of the population with pain and osteoarthritis um, that is so early that it's just not captured. So that led me into the uh, research that I'm doing on early osteoarthritis to help um, diagnose it earlier, um, predict progression of disease, and predict those who are at high risk of progressing so that eventually we can intervene with appropriate treatments. The reason for standardizing an examination technique like the knee is that if one physician examines a person and says, I think there's fluid in the knee, and then another physician examines the same person at the same time and says there isn't, then what's correct? For research, we need to be able to measure things accurately. And a key part of measuring accurately is doing it in a standardized way so you always get the same answer. The standardized examination of the knee requires a 30.5 centimeter goniometer, a tape measure, and adequate bilateral exposure of the subject's knees and thighs. As a general rule, all marginal findings should be recorded as absent or normal. Alignment by inspection. The subject stands facing the examiner. The subject's feet should be approximately shoulder width apart so that the subject stands comfortably. Weight should be borne equally on both feet. The examiner inspects for alignment of the femur and tibia without using a measuring device. Slight valgus at the knee, less than approximately 5 degrees, is normal. Alignment by inspection is scored as normal, varus, or valgus. Alignment by goniometer. The subject stands facing the examiner. The subject's feet should be approximately shoulder width apart so that the subject stands comfortably. Weight should be borne equally on both feet. The center of the goniometer is placed at the center of the patella. The goniometer is lined up mid-thigh above and along the patellar tendon below. The examiner reads off the measurement in degrees and takes note of whether varus or valgus degrees need to be recorded. Zero degrees can be recorded as either. Alignment by goniometer is scored as the number of degrees varus or valgus. Alignment by intercondylar distance. The subject stands facing away from the examiner. The subject's feet should be completely together and knees extended as much as possible. The examiner measures the distance between the medial femoral condyles with a tape measure. The intracondylar distance is recorded as the measurement in centimeters to the nearest one-tenth of a centimeter. Gait. The subject walks away from and back towards the examiner several times. The examiner inspects for any gait abnormality of the appropriate knee. Any abnormality during swing or stance phase should be scored as abnormal. Gait is scored as normal or abnormal. Extension leg. The subject sits at the edge of the examining table with legs dangling. The edge of the examining table should be approximately mid-thigh. The subject actively and slowly extends the knee as completely as possible. The examiner then takes hold of the actively extended knee by placing one hand proximal to the ankle joint and the other proximal to the knee joint. 
the examiner then passively tries to further extend the subject's knee. If further extension is possible, an extension lag is present and is graded in severity by the examiner. Extension lag is scored as absent, mild, moderate or severe. Quadriceps strength. The subject sits at the edge of the examining table with legs dangling. The edge of the examining table should be approximately mid-thigh. The examiner places his or her hand anteriorly just above the ankle joint. The subject is asked to slowly push the leg out towards the examiner while the examiner simultaneously pushes the leg towards the examination table. Full force should be achieved without movement of the leg. The subject's degree of resistance to the examiner's push is rated as full resistance, indicating normal quadriceps strength, moderate resistance, indicating mild quadriceps weakness, or poor resistance, indicating severe quadriceps weakness. Hamstring strength. The subject sits at the edge of the examining table with legs dangling. The edge of the examining table should be approximately mid-thigh. The examiner places his or her hand posteriorly just above the ankle joint. The subject is asked to slowly pull the leg away from the examiner into the examination table while the examiner simultaneously pulls the leg away from the examination table. Full force should be achieved without movement of the leg. The subject's degree of resistance to the examiner's pull is rated as full resistance, indicating normal hamstring strength, moderate resistance, indicating mild hamstring weakness, or poor resistance, indicating severe hamstring weakness. Quadriceps atrophy. The subject is supine with the knee extended. The examiner inspects the quadriceps muscle for size and bulk, particularly the medial component just above the knee joint, and notes the degree of atrophy. Quadriceps atrophy is scored as none, mild or severe. Joint diffusion bulge sign. The subject is supine with the knee extended and muscles relaxed. The examiner sweeps the medial recess of the knee joint upward such that any fluid is displaced from the medial side. The examiner then sweeps his or her hand from the suprapatellar pouch laterally and downward over the lateral recess of the knee joint to push fluid back into the medial side. The examiner looks for a bulge to appear in the medial recess. The bulge sign is scored as absent or present. Joint diffusion patellar tap. The subject is supine with the knee extended and muscles relaxed. With one hand, the examiner pushes fluid in the suprapatellar pouch inferiorly into the joint and then maintains slight pressure over the suprapatellar pouch. The examiner then pushes down on the patella to elicit a patellar tap. The patellar tap is scored as absent or present. Passive general crepitus. The subject is supine and muscles relaxed. The examiner flexes and extends the knee at least three times through a range of approximately 30 to 90 degrees with the subject passively allowing the movement. The examiner cups the knee anteriorly with one hand to feel for crepitus. A single snap or crack is scored as none. General passive crepitus is scored as none, fine or coarse. Passive medial tibiofemoral crepitus. The subject is supine. The examiner places the fingertips of the palpating hand over the medial tibiofemoral joint line and then flexes and extends the subject's knee at least three times through a range of approximately 30 to 90 degrees with the subject passively allowing the movement. A single snap or crack is scored as none. Passive medial tibiofemoral crepitus is scored as none, fine or coarse. Passive medial tibiofemoral crepitus with stress. The subject is supine. The examiner places the fingertips of the palpating hand over the medial tibiofemoral joint line. The examiner then applies a varus stress and externally rotates the tibia 
while flexing and extending the knee at least three times through a range of approximately 30 to 90 degrees with the subject passively allowing the movement. A single snap or crack is scored as none. Passive medial tibiofemoral crepitus with stress is scored as none, fine or coarse. Passive lateral tibiofemoral crepitus. The subject is supine. The examiner places the fingertips of the palpating hand over the lateral tibiofemoral joint line and then flexes and extends the subject's knee at least three times through a range of approximately 30 to 90 degrees with the subject passively allowing the movement. A single snap or crack is scored as none. Passive lateral tibiofemoral crepitus is scored as none, fine or coarse. Passive lateral tibiofemoral crepitus with stress. The subject is supine. The examiner places the fingertips of the palpating hand over the lateral tibiofemoral joint line. The examiner then applies a valgus stress and internally rotates the tibia while flexing and extending the knee at least three times through a range of approximately 30 to 90 degrees with the subject passively allowing the movement. A single snap or crack is scored as none. Passive lateral tibiofemoral crepitus with stress is scored as none, fine, or coarse. Passive patellofemoral crepitus. The subject is supine. The examiner places the fingertips of the palpating hand over and around the patella, but not on the other areas of the joint, and then flexes and extends the subject's knees at least three times through a range of approximately 30 to 90 degrees, with the subject passively allowing the movement. A single snap or crack is scored as none. Passive patellofemoral crepitus is scored as none, fine or coarse. Passive patellofemoral crepitus with stress. The subject is supine. The examiner places the fingertips of the palpating hand over and around the patella, but not on the other areas of the joint. The examiner then applies dorsal pressure on the patella while flexing and extending the knee at least three times through a range of approximately 30 to 90 degrees, with the subject passively allowing the movement. A single snap or crack is scored as none. Passive patellofemoral crepitus with stress is scored as none, fine or coarse. End of range stress pain. The subject is supine. The examiner flexes the knee with the subject passively allowing the movement. The examiner gently applies stress at the end of range of movement and assesses for pain response by observing the subject's facial expression. End of range stress pain is scored as absent or present. Medial instability at zero degrees of knee flexion. The subject is supine. The examiner places the subject's ankle under his or her axilla with one hand positioned over the subject's calf. The other hand is positioned above the knee joint to stabilize the thigh and avoid movement at the hip joint. The knee joint is at zero degrees flexion. The examiner then applies a valgus stress and observes for medial laxity. Medial instability at zero degrees of knee flexion is scored as normal or abnormal. Lateral instability at zero degrees of knee flexion. The subject is supine. The examiner places the subject's ankle under his or her axilla with one hand over the subject's calf. The other hand is positioned above the knee joint to stabilize the thigh and avoid movement at the hip joint. The knee joint is at zero degrees flexion. The examiner then applies a varus stress and observes for lateral laxity. Lateral instability at zero degrees of knee flexion is scored as normal or abnormal. Anterior instability by anterior drawer test. The subject is supine with the knee flexed to 90 degrees and muscles relaxed. From a neutral position of the tibia to the femur, the examiner draws the proximal tibia anteriorly in relation to the femur with both thumbs on the tibiofemoral joint line. Anterior movement of the tibia is indicative of instability and is rated as abnormal. The anterior drawer test is scored as normal or abnormal. Posterior instability by posterior drawer test. The subject is supine with knee flexed to 90 degrees and muscles relaxed. From a neutral position of the tibia to the femur, the examiner pushes the proximal tibia posteriorly in relation to the femur with the thumbs on the tibiofemoral joint line. 
The posterior drawer test is scored as normal or abnormal. Posterior instability by posterior sag. The subject is supine with both knees flexed to 90 degrees. The examiner inspects for posterior sagging of the tibia in relation to the femur. The posterior sag test is scored as normal or abnormal. Medial tibiofemoral tenderness. The subject is supine with the knee flexed 60 to 90 degrees. The examiner palpates the entire medial tibiofemoral joint line from the medial aspect of the patellar tendon to the medial knee. Medial tibiofemoral tenderness is scored as absent or present. Lateral tibiofemoral tenderness. The subject is supine with the knee flexed 60 to 90 degrees. The examiner palpates the entire lateral tibiofemoral joint line from the lateral aspect of the patellar tendon to the lateral knee. Lateral tibiofemoral tenderness is scored as absent or present. Patellar tendon tenderness. The subject is supine with the knee flexed 60 to 90 degrees. The examiner palpates from the inferior pole of the patella along the patellar tendon to the patellar insertion at the tibial tuberosity. Patellar tendon tenderness is scored as absent or present. Anserine bursa tenderness. The subject is supine with the knee flexed 60 to 90 degrees. The examiner palpates anteromedially 1 to 2 centimeters below the medial tibial joint line pressing firmly so that the finger blanches while observing the subject's facial expression. Anserine bursa tenderness is scored as absent or present. Bony swelling. The subject is supine with the knee flexed 60 to 90 degrees. The examiner palpates laterally and medially at the tibiofemoral joint line for bony swelling. Bony swelling is scored as none, mild, moderate, or severe. Hyperextension range of motion. The subject is supine. The examiner extends the subject's knee to the fullest with the subject passively allowing the movement and notes where the hyperextension is present. Hyperextension range of motion is scored as normal or abnormal. Flexion range of motion. The subject is supine. The examiner asks the subject to flex the knee as far as possible with the foot flat on the examination table. The examiner centers the goniometer at mid-patellar level laterally over the knee and aligns one arm of the goniometer with the greater trochanter and the other arm with the lateral malleolus. The examiner then reads off the degree of flexion. Flexion range of motion is scored as the number of degrees of flexion. Flexion contractor. The subject is supine. The examiner asks the subject to extend the knee as far as possible. The examiner centers the goniometer at mid-patellar level laterally over the knee and aligns one arm of the goniometer with the greater trochanter and the other arm with the lateral malleolus. The examiner then reads off the degree of flexion contracture. Flexion contracture is scored as the number of degrees of flexion contracture.